I need to record a second. There's a slight color di or <coughs> difference from the last time, so I'm going to just record for a second and then play it back against the old tape and match them. Okay. Okay. What was the difference, though? Because wasn't its weren't its component members, in other words, its its people, weren't they always sort of the the leaders? Yeah. Yeah. So what during what, the war what was the, the difference? The OSSP group, you know, that's right, the intellectual elite and all that stuff. Since it was the that's same always people, the problem. Why did they suddenly uh, become change? Be, uh, be, uh, change could become soft and become. Ah. Uh, uh, Well, they, they were mixed, you know what I mean, let's face it. There's a striking photograph taken of a ceremony in Hanoi, Vietnam, in 1953. A gust of wind entangled the American and Vietnamese flags, just as the, the winds of war were shortly to bitterly entangle the fates of the two nations. You were there. Uh, as they didn't have a camera. Have you seen this picture? You were astray. No, no, I wasn't in Hanoi. Right. Did you see it? Right. Yeah, let's hold a minute here. Hold okay. it. All right, well, we don't care. You think this is Hanoi. You're sure yeah. it's Hanoi and not yeah. Saigon. Let's do Saigon. I think you better say Saigon. You see, if it's the Vietnamese flag, it would not be yeah. Hanoi. It would be yes. the French flag. Yes. The tricolor. So I would say this is 56. That's right. Because that's Saigon. after we were yeah. in, too, and that, uh, yes. that'll make the answer shorter. <coughs> Mm-hmm. <coughs> okay. There's a striking photograph taken in Saigon in 1956. A gust of wind entangled the Vietnamese and American flags just as the gusts of the winds of war had uh, bitterly and were soon to bitterly, more bitterly entangle the fates of the two nations. You were there as Vice President. Looking back today at the American experience in Vietnam, at the billions of dollars, the millions of refugees, the hundreds of thousands of wounded, the 57,000 Americans dead, and at the fact that in a matter of a couple of months in 1975, South Vietnam fell and the communists took over in the end anyway. Looking back today, do you think that it was worth it? 
Yes, I think it was when you consider what we were trying to prevent. Uh, we were trying to prevent a communist takeover of South Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, and Laos. Uh, you have mentioned, as you properly should, uh, the number of people that it costs. Uh, I would say, however, that in addition to the Americans who died, uh, in addition to the South Vietnamese and the North Vietnamese, the Cambodians, uh, that if you add it all up, uh, that figure, let's start again on that. I got another thought there. I'll start again. Uh, <clears throat> is this, no, this is the photograph. Now, where are the flags? See. They, they, we, we, oh, we missed that. Can we do that? Yeah, I want to. I get the feel of it now. <clears throat> Let's pick it up. No, you. Are you, you want me to start, or, or you're going to? Are you going to ask can, the question no, again? You can. Um, <clears throat> yes, I would have to say that I. Wait a minute. Yes, I believe it was. Uh, it is true the cost was enormous for us, for the South Vietnamese, for the North Vietnamese, the Cambodians, and the Laotians in terms of lives lost. But what we were trying to do was to prevent a communist takeover of those countries. And when we see what has happened since the communists have taken over, uh, three million, for example, estimated uh, killed and starved to death in Cambodia alone, that is far more than the total casualty civilian and military suffered by all those in Vietnam. That was worth fighting against. The tragedy is that we lost it in the end. Our subject in this conversation with former President Richard Nixon is the American involvement and the war in Vietnam. The American involvement in Vietnam bega began uh, seriously under President Eisenhower. You were the vice president then. Why did we go into Vietnam in the first place? Well, first, let's get the history a little more accurately. Uh, the American involvement in Vietnam began before President Eisenhower came in in 1953. Uh, in 1949 and 50 and 51, the Truman administration, uh, recognizing very properly that what happened in Vietnam would affect us all over Asia, uh, made a major commitment to Vietnam, to the French in Vietnam, uh, and by the time that President Eisenhower came in, one-third of the cost uh, of the French in Vietnam was being borne by the United States. Uh, President Eisenhower continued uh, the program which President Truman had initiated. You visited uh, Vietnam in 1953 before the American involvement had uh, begun seriously and before we had become involved in the, uh, in the war that the French were still fighting. In fact, you not only visited Saigon, but you visited Hanoi. What were your impressions in those last halcyon days of the cities, the country, and the people of Vietnam? Well, as you already implied, uh, this was a time when the French were still in Vietnam. Uh, and it was interesting to see what they had done right and what they, in my opinion, had done wrong. Uh, we have to give them credit that when they were in Vietnam, this is in both Hanoi and in Saigon, uh, they had built some fine hospitals and schools. Uh, they had also built sanitation systems. Uh, they had produced, certainly, uh, a rather substantial standard of living for that part of the world. Uh, on the other hand, insofar as the mistake that they made, uh, it was that they were trying, in effect, to stay in Vietnam uh, rather than to prepare the Vietnamese uh, to rule themselves. Uh, and under the circumstances, that simply would not survive against the onslaught from Ho Chi Minh, who stood for an independent, free Vietnam. How were we better than the French, or were we better than the French? Well, in one respect, I think the French made a very serious mistake, and that was in having a virtual gulf uh, between themselves and the Vietnamese. Uh, I saw that very clearly, for example, when I was in Hanoi and visited the battlefields. Uh, one day at noon, uh, I ate uh, lunch with uh, French officers, and they had a fine uh, food uh, 
in perhaps the best French tradition with uh, a good Bordeaux wine uh, to finish it off with. Uh, then I asked to go over to the Vietnamese mess where the Vietnamese officers were. Uh, that idea didn't particularly appeal to my host, but I insisted because I wanted to see what they were doing. And as we approached the Vietnamese mess, uh, the, as it is called in the service, uh, there was a terrible stench. And I turned to my French escort and I said, what is that? What are they eating? And he sort of uh, picked up his nose a bit rather haughtily and he says, probably monkey. Now, that little story indicates their attitude toward the Vietnamese. Not that they all had that, uh, but it was one where they were superior, uh, where they were not building up the morale, the dignity, and so forth, which was essential if the Vietnamese were ever to govern themselves and to carry the fight alone. Now, as far as the U.S. was concerned, we did not make that kind of mistake. On the other hand, uh, the mistake we did make, particularly after President Eisenhower left office, was rather than doing as President Eisenhower did, uh, supporting uh, the government of Vietnam uh, in its efforts uh, to uh, uh, handle the insurgency, uh, the Viet Cong and the Viet Minh who were conducting guerrilla war against them, uh, that instead of doing it that way, uh, in the next period, they took over the war and in effect Americanized it. And that was, of course, a fatal mistake. When President Eisenhower left office, there <clears throat> were roughly a thousand American troops. Under President Kennedy, the number substantially increased. Why and how did that happen? Well, first, uh, the military personnel that were there during the Eisenhower period were not combat troops. They were training troops. Uh, they were not involved in combat. Uh, President Kennedy raised the number to 16,000 uh, because he saw that unless it was uh, raised, there was a possibility that the Vietnamese, the South Vietnamese, would not be able to hold the line. And he authorized, in 1962, the Americans uh, to, in, to join the Vietnamese in combat units. Uh, consequently, in his last year in office, 1963, there were about 500 American casualties. On November 2nd, 1963, mm -hmm. American newspapers carried the headlines about the overthrow of President Diem in South Vietnam. It was subsequently revealed that the coup which ousted him was at the least inspired and at the most manufactured in Washington. Was President Kennedy responsible for the murder of President Jam in 1953? No, I wouldn't say that. Uh, I'm sure that he did not intend it. Uh, I would be very surprised if he were not greatly shocked by it. Uh, however, I think looking at it very objectively, as for example Marguerite Higgins, an outstanding journalist with the New York Herald Tribune, and a Kennedy supporter wrote after she had investigated the situation. Looking at it from that standpoint, it is quite clear uh, that the policies which the Kennedy administration adopted toward Vietnam led to the coup, which inevitably led to the assassination of Diem. They set in motion the events which led to it. Uh, and in this case, uh, uh, General Maxwell Taylor, I think, has put it very well when he indicated in effect that uh, they greased the skids for uh, Diem's downfall and uh, of course having done that, uh, that's a, the Vietnamese do not play uh, very gently. Uh, Diem was one of casualty. Could President Kennedy have prevented the murder of President Diem? He could have only prevented it had he not listened to and taken the advice of uh, some of his advisors uh, who were urging that he dump Diem. Uh, they were urging that he dump Diem uh, for the reason that they believed that Diem was corrupt uh, and that also he was too much of a dictator. Uh, they didn't recognize that the choice was not between Diem and somebody better, but between Diem and somebody much worse. Uh, and so uh, he took that advice. Uh, that was a very great mistake and I'm sure that he regretted it because President Kennedy, I am confident, uh, would not have ordered or approved the assassination of Diem. President Kennedy and the Kennedy administration denied any uh, complicity, complicity any, more than any complicity, any involvement in or any uh, encouragement of or any <laughs> knowledge of the Diem coup. 
does that mean that they weren't telling the truth when they said that? Well, I won't get into whether or not they deliberately misled on that particular point. However, the facts would indicate, uh, the facts of, from people who were there, uh, that there isn't any question, but they set in motion uh, the events which led uh, to the assassination of Diem. Let me, let me make the point very clear. Uh, we have to understand uh, that the Vietnamese military depended on the United States for support. Without our support, they would be unable uh, to carry on uh, the activities that they were uh, engaged in in trying to prevent the communist takeover. When the U.S. indicated that we would support them, uh, as was indicated in the event that they did initiate a coup, uh, that inevitably put in motion uh, the events which led to Diem's assassination. Now, that is the historical record, and I don't think any rewriting of history can excuse those who gave Kennedy that very bad advice. In 1971, could you have prevented the assassination of President Allende of Chile if you had directed American policy towards Chile differently? No, I think uh, we have to distinguish between what happened in Chile and what happened in Vietnam. Uh, in Vietnam, uh, we have to understand that Diem was our friend. He was our ally. Uh, in Chile, Allende was no friend. Uh, as a matter of fact, he had joined Castro as a potential enemy of the United States in Latin America. Uh, and the second point that should be made is this, uh, that while after Allende was elected, by a plurality, not a majority of the vote. Uh, it is true that we, like previous administrations, did everything we possibly could to see if the majority parties who were non-Marxist or anti-Allende could get together and prevent his being uh, elected as president by the parliament. Uh, we failed in that effort, and it was two years later that Allende brought himself down. Marxism simply didn't work there. Uh, the country was an economic and political disaster area, and the coup which came there came from within the country. Let me put it very directly in terms of the contrast. In Vietnam, a, a coup against Diem could not have occurred without the support of the United States because those troops, those generals, depended upon the United States. In the case of Chile, the coup did occur and would have gone forward without our support in any event because Allende had created a situation where the whole country was rebelling against what he had done to it. It, uh, it has since been uh, revealed in Senate uh, Intelligence Committee uh, in, uh, hearings, Senate Intelligence hearings, that President Kennedy uh, and or the Kennedy administration were involved in assassinations or assassination attempts against uh, Castro, Patrice Lumumba, Rafael Trujillo, uh, President Jim, uh, General uh, Schneider in Chile. Do you think uh, that there are any circumstances in which a president of the United States should desire or seek the assassination of a foreign leader? Well, I think we'd have to separate desire from seeking it. Uh, I am sure that every president at some times must say, gee, I wish that fellow were gone or he was off the stage one way or another. But as far as seeking the assassination of a foreign leader in peacetime, and I want to distinguish that, I would say I cannot imagine any president of the United States seeking that. Uh, and in the case of Diem, while it was wartime, uh, it was a different situation than uh, we would normally think of as, for example, during World War II. What about, uh, speaking of World War II, what about Hitler? Or what about, what about Idi Amin? If the director of CIA had come into the Oval Office and said to you, we have an absolutely foolproof, untraceable way in which we can remove Idi Amin from the scene, uh, which would involve his murder, would you have approved it? Would you have uh, acquiesced in it? Would you have said, do it, but for God's sake, don't tell me, or would you have forbidden it? Uh, I would have forbidden it. Uh, and may I say that uh, while I was president, I don't recall any instance where the CIA or any people 
uh, outside the CIA area suggested that the administration participate in an assassination plot. Uh, apparently that sort of thing did occur in the early 60s. Uh, however, I again emphasize I do not believe that President Kennedy uh, personally approved an assassination plot. I, I would say that as far as the Hitler situation is concerned, uh, you have to separate that in terms of it being a period of war. Now, during war, uh, we have to understand is that everything is done uh, to try to eliminate the capacity of the other to wage war. That is why, for example, at the present time, uh, American missiles are aimed at Soviet command centers and Soviet missiles are aimed at Washington, D.C., and also at our command centers. Uh, if those missiles should land, it's going to eliminate whoever happens to be the leader of either country. Given the record of the CIA, do you think that they, uh, during your administration, do you think they, they would have been capable of developing a foolproof and or untraceable plot of any kind? No, the record of the CIA, certainly in our administration, uh, was very spotty, if I can use British understatement. Uh, in terms of what it was able to accomplish, I had very little confidence in them. Uh, and I had very little confidence in their intelligence reports. For example, they were always greatly underestimating what the Soviet Union was doing in terms of its missile development. Uh, for 10 or years uh, straight, I remember that their estimates were too low. Uh, I think during the earlier period, immediately after war, during the Eisenhower period, when Alan Dulles was in charge of the CIA, it was far more competent than it was later. Uh, now that is not to reflect negatively on people like Richard Helms and others uh, who served the country with great dedication. I'm simply saying uh, that uh, they, in my opinion, did not have the capability that they could have had. And I wouldn't have counted on them to carry out such a mission as that, assuming I might have ever ordered one. Do you think that President Kennedy's involvement with the assassination attempts on Fidel Castro led directly or indirectly to President Kennedy's assassination? Well, of course, there is the conspiracy uh, theory. Uh, I particularly find in my visits to Europe, to France, that they, they believe very confidently that that's exactly what had happened. Uh, it could have happened uh, in, in view of the fact that Oswald, of course, had been to Cuba. Uh, and uh, it is one theory uh, that I think you could make a case for. My guess is it probably did not happen that way. After studying it at considerable length, I believe that Oswald uh, was acting alone. Do you think that uh, Bulgarian intelligence was behind the assassination attempt on Pope John Paul II? Possible. Uh, and it's also possible, of course, as some have suggested, if, that if Bulgarian in, uh, intelligence or KGB was behind the assassination attempt, uh, that the Soviet intelligence case, KGB had to know about it, and that Andropov, uh, who was, of course, uh, in Soviet intelligence and had been the head of the KGB, had to know about it. Uh, I would only say, in respect to Andropov at least, I think he's perfectly capable of that, but I think he's too intelligent to have been involved in it. If you were president and it were proven that the Bulgarians were behind the assassination attempt on the Pope and that the KGB with Andropov as its head were behind the Bulgarians and he was now in the position he's in and you were president. What impact would that have, if any, on your dealings with him? There are stories that in the White House and in the State Department now, uh, some uh, forces are trying to soft pedal the investigation into the so-called Bulgarian connection because should it pan out, that would mean that the, uh, there would be problems in President, Railing, in President Reagan dealing with Andropov. Uh, if, he's, if the finger of suspicion points directly at Andropov, at Andropov, what does that mean for an American president and his dealings with him? That puts a very tough question to an American president. But under the circumstances, uh, the American president, of course, uh, would have to uh, take them on directly about what had happened, uh, obviously would condemn it. Uh, they, of course, would deny it. Uh, but even though it were proved that that was the case, we have to realize a fact of life. Uh, the Soviets lie, they cheat, 
They engage in assassination plots and murder plots all over the world, but they are there and we have to deal with them. That doesn't mean that we have to lie and cheat and assassinate, uh, but it does mean that in dealing with them we recognize those with whom we are dealing, uh, recognize that under the circumstances uh, we have to be just as tough and even doubly tough at the conference table if we are not to be taken over. Did, did John Kennedy, did President Kennedy order the assassination of Fidel Castro? No, I do not believe that he could have done that. Uh, I, 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 a moment ago I said that uh, Andropov was capable of it. Uh, I do not think that President Kennedy uh, was capable of having ordered the assassination of Castro. What about uh, in terms of the documents and conversations that were revealed in the, uh, in the 1970s in the Senate uh, intelligence hearings, uh, the, uh, which, which virtually proved that uh, although there were no there, there, there were no tapes or there was no absolute uh, proof, but that President Kennedy was involved in the conversations uh, uh, concerning the assassination and indeed the techniques, including the bizarre techniques, the exploding cigars and things like that, uh, that the CIA was planning in order to kill Castro. The, uh, the theory, of course, being that, that Kennedy's uh, uh, pride uh, and prestige was seriously hurt by the threat Castro mm -hmm. had posed. Well, let me go back historically to how this all relates to Vietnam. I think it's very important for us to understand this. Uh, President Kennedy, as you recall, in his very eloquent inaugural in 1961, said, we will fight any time, any place in defense of freedom. Uh, his first broadcast out of the Oval Office, two weeks after he was inaugurated, with was with regard to Laos, when he said uh, that the United States would keep its commitments to Laos. Uh, then came the Bay of Pigs, uh, which was a failure, uh, a failure in my opinion because of failing to carry out the plan that President Eisenhower had uh, directed and which President Eisenhower told me later would never have been approved without the use of air power, which of course was denied in adequate amounts. And then after that, uh, President Kennedy met uh, uh, Khrushchev at Vienna and Scotty Reston of the New York Times reported that uh, Khrushchev bullied him. Uh, Khrushchev following uh, the usual Leninist dictum, uh, which says, probe with the bayonets. If you find mush, proceed. If you find steel, withdraw. Now, President Kennedy was not a weak man. He was not a soft man. Uh, he was a tough guy. Uh, and after all these things happening, he was determined that Khrushchev and the communists generally should not assume that they had found mush. Now that, of course, if you have to understand that, in order to understand why he felt it was important to increase uh, the number of Americans in Vietnam. Uh, that was why he thought it was important to us have these Americans participate in military exercise, even though it cost some casualties. Uh, and unfortunately, I think that was one of the reasons that he was led into the mistake of supporting the coup, uh, which brought down Diem, because he had become convinced by his advisors, I think very improperly, uh, that if coup, if Diem left, that they'd have a stronger government. Now, with all this background in mind, we have to understand that President Kennedy may have felt he needed a victory. Uh, however, while he might have toyed with the ideas, uh, as we all do from time to time, we need, may discuss them, I think if push came to shove between the rock and the hard place, President Kennedy would not have said, go out and knock this fellow off in order to make me look tough. I don't think he would have done it. Not because uh, he was not tough enough to do it, but because he would recognize that doing it uh, would lead to repercussions that would be perhaps more detrimental uh, than it would be positive in the long run. You have to remember uh, that removing a leader from a position, even though it's a Castro, it does not necessarily solve the problem. Uh, the problems that brought him into power are still there. Uh, and the forces that brought him into power are still there. Castro wouldn't be able to survive in Cuba today unless he had some support. Uh, I don't believe he's got majority support, but he had some, and that was the case back then as well. We have some film of you with President Jim in 1956.
two leaders conferred for an hour and a half. Mr. Nixon extended President Eisenhower's warmest personal congratulations, well earned by a man and his people who had shown astonishing progress and spirit through two difficult years. At President Diem's invitation, the visitor from Washington joined him in facing the vast assemblage outside. The argument has been made that President Jem was an appallingly corrupt dictator who had little and deserved less popular support. You have written a book about leaders. What were your impressions of Jem then, and what is your assessment of him as a leader now? Well, at first, as far as corruption is concerned, we have to understand, and this does not excuse it, but we have to understand that corruption is endemic in that part of the world. Uh, in the Philippines, in Indonesia, uh, the other countries in that area. As far as Diem is concerned, I would not say that he was any more corrupt than those that have succeeded him, for example. Uh, the second thing we have to understand, insofar as public support is concerned, uh, and I'm glad we showed this film, that he had a great deal of public support. I was there, I saw it. Uh, now you can trot a lot of people out in order to welcome a visiting vice president. Uh, but while you can get them out, you can't get them to cheer uh, spontaneously. And there was no question that Diem had a mystique, a strength. He was able to stay in power for nine years. And when he was there, for example, from 1954 to 1961, uh, when President Eisenhower left office, uh, he was very much in control. Uh, we did not have to have any American combat troops serving with his units and he had the insurgency very well under control. I think that if we had continued to support him, uh, we would not have had the musical chairs which eventually led to uh, the enormous American commitment there of 550,000 men. Getting rid of Diem was supposed to, po uh, to pave the way for victory. That was the rationale for the coup. What were the results of the coup? Well, General Maxwell Taylor put it very well when he said it led to chaos, uh, and I can I can say from personal experience, I know what happened. Uh, I was in Vietnam uh, in 53, uh, again in 56. This was the first anniversary of Diem's ascension as uh, the leader of Vietnam. And then I was there in 1963, 1964, 1960, I'm sorry. I was there again in 1964, 65, 66, and 67, four times in the 60s. Each time, there was a new leader. 1964, it was big men. I don't remember who was there in 1965. I don't recall who was there in 1966. I think it was Key. 1967, it was finally two. And that meant the weak leadership that you had uh, meant that the uh, South Vietnamese simply didn't develop the capability of fighting this war themselves. Uh, it also required an enormous American commitment, which would not have been necessary had we had a strong leader like Diem in charge uh, who could have developed the capability of his own people to defend themselves. In 1963, when Lyndon Johnson inherited the Vietnam mm -hmm. War, there were 16,000 American troops there. Five years later, in 1968, there were more than a half a million American troops. How did that happen? Well, it happened uh, because the North Vietnamese, who incidentally going clear back to 1961, had stimulated, inspired, and controlled the Viet Cong in the South, uh, despite the fact that they always denied that that was the case. The North Vietnamese were able to launch very, very effective attacks uh, using the Viet Cong as well uh, against the existing governments in uh, South Vietnam. Uh, as a result of the commitment of 16,000 we already had there, uh, President Johnson uh, felt that we at least had to defend them. Uh, he didn't want to withdraw and have the whole situation collapse. Uh, and he had to escalate the number we had there because the enemy was escalating its attacks. And at the same time, we were not doing a good enough job, in my opinion, of preparing the South Vietnamese to do the fighting on their own. Uh, let me explain how it happened, in my opinion. I go clear back to the Korean War. I remember hearing uh, American military people telling me in 1949 and 50, the rocks won't fight. 
The rocks can't fight, and they could fight. Uh, no, the South Korean army today is one of the best armies in the world, uh, but Americans usually are a very impatient people. Uh, we believe we know what's best. We believe we can do it faster and quicker, and so we move in and take over. And Key, Vice President Key, General Key, or Marshal Key, as he's called in Vietnam, put it very well when he said uh, that what the United States did uh, was in effect to uh, uh, steal their war or take it over. Uh, and that was the mistake. Uh, I must say that uh, I recall very well that Johnson, uh, during his campaign against Goldwater, said that uh, uh, pledged to the American people that he was not going to have American boys go thousands of miles across the Pacific uh, to do things for, for Asian boys that Asian boys should be doing for themselves. Uh, and later on, uh, President Goldwater, I mean, uh, President Johnson, of course, had to eat those words. We, in fact, have a uh, film clip of that speech uh, which was made, that particular speech which was made in August 1964 to the American Bar Association. It's chilling, as late as 1964, to hear President Johnson talk about 200 American lives lost in Vietnam. And that would be about 10,000 casualties when you consider the wounded. The wounded. Did Lyndon Johnson lie to the American people about our involvement or about his intentions regarding our involvement in the war in Vietnam? No, uh, not consciously, not in my opinion. Uh, I think uh, Lyndon Johnson um, believed, as sometimes we all like to do, what he wanted to believe. Uh, he wanted desperately to believe that this war uh, could be fought uh, on the basis of gradual escalation. Uh, he wanted desperately to believe that it was possible to have his great society and a war at the same time. Uh, he was without question a man of peace. On the other hand, uh, he I think rationalized himself into believing uh, that the war was going much better than it was ever going. Uh, and he rationalized into believing uh, that uh, his way of conducting it, uh, which was the worst of both worlds, neither going all in or all out, uh, was not working. I asked you whether President Johnson lied. Let me put it another way. Given all the good intentions he had and all the uh, things he was weighing in his mind when he talked to the American people and to Congress about our involvement at, in Vietnam. Did he always tell the truth? Well, that's another way of saying, did he lie? Uh, and when we say, did he tell the truth, certainly what he said was not true. Uh, but when you say, did he lie, did he deliberately uh, get up there and say, I know this is uh, not true and I'm saying something else? No, I don't think Lyndon Johnson did that. Uh, He's a, he was a very practical man, uh, very earthy, uh, and uh, despite some of the rather negative things that have been written about him, uh, a, a patriotic man. 
He wanted to do what was right. He was a peace-loving man. I think in this case, he wanted so desperately to believe that things were going well, uh, so desperately believe that what he was doing uh, would bring a peace and also a peace uh, not at the cost of surrender uh, to the forces of uh, the communists. He wanted so desperately to believe that, that when he said it, he did not think that he was lying. It happened, however, that what he said, that his optimistic reports about how well the war was going, uh, his optimistic uh, statements to the effect uh, that we were not going to commit more American boys to do the fighting that should be done by Asian boys. Uh, all of these things, of course, uh, I think did not happen to be true. But I don't believe that Lyndon, Lyndon Johnson deliberately was lying. Does, does not telling the truth at all times come with the job of being president? Well, when you ask, did, did Lyndon Johnson lie uh, about our involvement in Vietnam, I, let me put it in historical context. Uh, he didn't lie any more than Franklin D. Roosevelt lied. Uh, when uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1940, uh, and I remember it very well, uh, said in his campaign against uh, Wilkie uh, that uh, we were not going to have our boys uh, fight in foreign wars. Uh, now Roosevelt at that time, uh, all the records have since shown, was very deliberately uh, and passionately working to get the United States into the war in Europe because he recognized it, and in retrospect I think very properly, that we had to do so, that we could not allow Hitler to overrun Europe without it having been a great threat to the United States in the long run. On the other hand, as far as Roosevelt was concerned, uh, it would have to be said uh, that he was misleading the American people. And I think in this case, Johnson may have misled the American people, uh, but it was no more a lie uh, in the moral sense uh, than uh, it was in the case of FDR. In August 1968, Lyndon Johnson promised you that he would not announce a bombing halt before the November presidential election. In October, with his candidate, Hubert Humphrey, trailing you in the polls, President Johnson went on television and dropped a bombshell of his own. We have a film of that moment. In your memoirs, you wrote, announcing the halt so close to the election was utterly callous if politically calculated and utterly naive if sincere. Which was it, callous or naive? Well, I don't think that you could ever say that Lyndon Johnson was naive. Uh, he used to know pretty much what he was doing at all time, and he was a, con a consummate politician. Uh, I would have to say in retrospect that uh, he was motivated to a certain extent, I'm sure, by political considerations. And he was egged on, uh, ironically, uh, by some of his advisors who were more violently anti-Nixon than he was. Uh, I don't mean that he wasn't pro-Humphrey, uh, but I mean that as far as some of his advisors were concerned, uh, people like Clark Clifford and George Ball and Averill Harriman, uh, they uh, egged him on uh, to make this kind of announcement before the election, having in mind the fact that it could tip the scales in Humphrey's favor. Uh, I think under the circumstances, uh, as uh, one of the newspaper articles wrote, uh, one of the newspaper reporters wrote after he heard this speech, uh, it was happened to be very close to Halloween, and he said that last night that President Johnson had given uh, uh, pre uh, uh, Mr. Nixon a, a trick and uh, Hubert Humphrey a treat. And that's the way it turned out. It almost won the election for Hubert Humphrey. Weren't you furious 
to at the last minute, at the 11th hour, after all you'd been through, and with the presidency so finally so close, to risk having it taken away from you by what you had to have seen as a cynical partisan action on Johnson's part? Well, before we go so far in characterizing it as being totally cynical and partisan, let us understand that Lyndon Johnson also was thinking of his place in history. He didn't want this election to go by. He didn't want to see me elected and then to bring the peace that he was unable to achieve. And I think, therefore, he wanted to believe that a bombing halt would work. He later told me that it didn't, of course, and that he was misled on it by Mr. Harriman. But on the other hand, uh, I would say that there's no question in the heat of the campaign that uh, I was very distressed, uh, and all of my associates were, uh, to think that this should be pulled out of the hat right before the election at a time that uh, it was bound to give Humphrey, uh, as we said a moment ago, a treat and give me a trick which would defeat us. Did you let him know that you were distressed? I let him know actually through my associates. Uh, I had uh, others call him uh, or, his, uh, or his advisors uh, and let them know that we were quite disturbed. Uh, he was very sensitive about it, incidentally. Uh, he was sensitive then uh, when uh, Bob Finch had made uh, some statement to the effect that he didn't have all the ducks in a row because uh, President Tew didn't go along with the bombing halt, and that's the only reason that, that perhaps uh, uh, it did not succeed in tipping the election scales because disillusionment set in within a couple of days thereafter, just before the election. Uh, that uh, he, I talked to him on the phone, uh, and he was violent in his criticism of Finch and what he had said. Uh, but later on, about a year later, I had breakfast with Johnson in the White House. And uh, he said to me, he said, I want you to know that I didn't do it for political reasons. And then I remember how vehemently he talked. You know, he was a very physical man. He sort of grabbed me by the uh, elbow and hit the table, and he said, you know, Harriman told me at least 12 times that he had an absolute commitment from the Russians, uh, that they would uh, lean on the North Vietnamese and that the North Vietnamese would uh, negotiate seriously and reduce their attacks on the cities and their attacks in the South. And he said, they, he said all the bombing halts were a mistake. That was a mistake. They were all a mistake. We never got anything but words from the other side. It's November 1968. You're president-elect. Mm -hmm. You're looking at options for Vietnam. You have been elected with a, or you've been given a free hand, arguably a mandate for change. The war is divisive and uh, unpopular. Men are dying. Tu is unpopular and corrupt. Why didn't you do one of two things? either do what had to be done militarily in order to win and end the war by victory, or develop a, a sort of withdrawal with honor option, cut our losses, and, uh, and get us the hell out of Vietnam. Well, first, <clears throat> the, you have two options. One is called the option to the right, and the other is called the option to the left. The option to the right, unfortunately, had been uh, completely taken away from us by the bombing halt. Uh, by reason of the bombing halt, I was bound by it, even though I had not negotiated it. Uh, and so uh, the negotiations were going on in Paris, and I sent Cabot Lodge over there to indicate how serious we were to try to find a negotiated settlement. Uh, and so as far as taking military action was concerned, uh, I felt that that option had been, uh, had been taken away from us. Uh, let me say also that while you say that I was elected with the mandate, uh, we have to realize that both houses of the Congress were under the control of the Democrats. This was very difficult, uh, different from the situation that President Johnson had after 1964. He had two to one majorities in both the House and the Senate. He could have done anything that he wanted in Vietnam and gotten away with it. He just provided he'd leveled with the Congress and leveled with the country. And that, in Eisenhower's opinion and in mine too, was his great mistake gradual escalation, uh, and as a result, we have 500,000 500, in Vietnam uh, rather than 16,000 when he came into office with, of course, enormous more casualties. Now, as far as the other particular option is concerned, the option to the left, 
I know that there were those among my political advisors who said, uh, look, Kennedy st started the American commitment in Vietnam, at least the commitment to combat units uh, and combat advisors. Uh, Johnson escalated it. Uh, now you can end it uh, and put the blame on them for what happened in Vietnam. In other words, bug out. Uh, I couldn't do that, and frankly, I never considered it. Uh, I said, in effect, this is not Kennedy's war, as some would suggest, or Johnson's war, it is America's war. I knew what would happen. I had been there. I had been there going back to 1953. I was there in 53, 56, and four times in the 60s. And I knew that if we were to get out of Vietnam then, the communists would overrun it. I also knew uh, that if we got out under those circumstances, it would have a devastating effect on our other allies in that area. Uh, the Thais, for example, uh, the Filipinos, and so forth. Uh, and I also knew, and this is a conviction I have even today, I knew it would have a devastating effect on the American morale on our willingness to play a credible role in the world because there'd be instant relief for a while. And then there would be a turning inward and say, why do we have this loss of life for nothing? What would it have taken to win <coughs> militarily in Vietnam in 1969, or was a military victory impossible given the guerrilla nature of the war? In 1969, a military victory over the North was not impossible. Uh, in fact, if I have a regret, it was that I was unable to do early in 1969 what I later did in 1972, to bomb and mine in the Haiphong, Hanoi area, uh, because we could have brought the North Vietnamese military capability to its knees. And without the North Vietnamese support, the South Vietnamese would have been able to handle uh, the Viet Cong in the South. There was no question about that. Uh, incidentally, there were some what I call super hawks, who thought we should have gone further. Uh, they said that we could bomb the dikes uh, in North Vietnam, uh, particularly in the winter, in the wet season. And others say we could use tactical nuclear weapons. I ruled both of those out for two reasons. Uh, one, uh, because I didn't think it was necessary in the event we went on the military option. I thought that the bombing and mining, which I had advocated incidentally in the 60s after visiting Vietnam, that that enough would quarantine North Vietnam, which was the phrase that I used. Uh, on the other hand, I felt that if we used nuclear weapons or uh, if we caused hundreds of thousands of deaths of innocent people in North, in North Vietnam in order to win the war, uh, it would be a Pyrrhic victory. It would have had devastating consequences all over Asia, including particularly in Japan, which was the big prize in Asia today as it was then. In your inaugural address in 1969, you said, let us take as our goal where peace is unknown, make it welcome, where peace is fragile, make it strong, where peace is temporary, make it permanent. Less than two months later, you authorized secret bombing of neutral Cambodia. Why did you expand in secret the war you were talking about ending in public? Well, let us understand first that uh, secret military actions in war are not uncommon. In fact, they're very desirable. Uh, President Eisenhower, for example, ordered all kinds of disinformation with regard to where the Americans and the other forces would land on the continent uh, when he went into Normandy. Uh, it was deliberately to mislead them. Uh, and uh, I would say that as far as this is concerned, we have to recognize that this was wartime. Now the reason for its being secret, and the, first the reason it was done, the North Vietnamese, uh, despite the fact uh, that we were adhering to the conditions of the bombing halter and were not bombing, uh, they were violating whatever conditions that they were supposed to agree to. They were shelling cities, uh, they were infiltrating more troops, and, and what particularly concerned us uh, they were sending in great numbers of combat forces into the Cambodian sanctuaries. The net result of all that was to increase our casualties. Uh, and as I saw those casualty lists every week grow, I knew that we had to do something. Uh, I knew that we couldn't break off the Paris talks, not yet, uh, but I knew we had to do something in order to stop that. Now the point is, why not do it openly? 
But the reason, interestingly enough, was that the North Vietnamese claimed that they didn't have any forces in South Vietnam. They claimed they didn't have any in Cambodia. They said it was all local civil war. Now that was, of course, not true. But for that reason, we knew that if we bombed secretly, they could not object, and they didn't. Also, the other reason we had to bomb secretly is that we did not bomb what is called neutral Cambodia. We bombed enemy occupied territories in Cambodia. Now, Sihanouk, Prince Sihanouk of Cambodia, as a matter of fact, wanted the Vietnamese out of that area. But he, since he was neutral, uh, would have to object in the event that we openly bombed. All right, let's look at what happened. Uh, we conducted very successful bombing raids. It reduced our casualties because it, it uh, inhibited the North Vietnamese from making their hit and run attacks on our troops on the border in that area. And it's only unfortunate that the leak of the fact of the, the, that bombing was taking place, uh, that it became public, which made it necessary for us to discontinue it, uh, because Sihanouk, of course, had then to object to it. And as a result of that leak, it cost American lives. Discontinuing the bombing uh, gave them a privileged sanctuary from which to make their runs at our forces in Vietnam. Are you saying that the reporter who wrote that story based on a leak in the uh, New York Times, which in that case published that story, caused American li cost American lives? He certainly did, without question. And he isn't going to be able to rub the blood off his hands simply by rewriting history. As you say, or you say, that uh, secrecy is needed in wartime, how did you feel then several years later when the House Judiciary Committee uh, considered, although it voted down in the committee by a vote of, I think, 20... Uh, 26 to 12, a fourth article of impeachment uh, which said that you should have been tried, uh, convicted, uh, and impeached and removed from office because in 1969 you had lied to Congress about the secret bombing of Vietnam, of, uh, sorry, of Cambodia. Well, first I would say that the Judiciary Committee in this instance, uh, I think, uh, showed some responsibility. Uh, I'm only surprised that that many members of the Judiciary Committee, in view of what happened in Cambodia uh, uh, later, uh, and uh, uh, I, no, I like that. I, I'm, I'm only surprised that uh, that many in the Judiciary Committee would even consider that an impeachable offense. Uh, the second point is uh, that if the time ever comes when an American president cannot do uh, what is necessary as Commander-in-Chief to defend the lives of American servicemen, then believe me, we'd better give up on this country. I hope that American presidents in the future will have the wisdom and the guts to do what is necessary to protect our men when we commit them to battle. If we aren't able to do that, then we shouldn't send them into battle. And that's exactly what I was doing. Almost from, uh, as you say, almost from the start of your administration, you were, pl you were plagued with a, uh, with a spate of leaks of classified information. And uh, in the early months, you authorized wiretaps to be placed on members of the White House staff and on journalists. Looking back today, were those wiretaps justified? Oh, yes, they were justified. Uh, they didn't uh, produce anything in terms of finding out who was doing the leaking although they might have had the effect of perhaps that we couldn't even estimate of discouraging some of those uh, who might have intended the leak if they didn't know that they might be tapped. In, in fact, though, the results were the contrary. The, the leaks not only continued but, but multiplied. How is it that since these taps were placed and indeed were extended as was felt necessary, why didn't they, uh, I think at one point you described them as a dry, uh, you described the results as a dry hold, globs and globs of crap. How, how was it, uh, since J. Edgar Hoover had said that taps were the most effective way to catch a thief, why didn't these taps provide something, produce something? Well, I think that would indicate that uh, those who were leaking were doing it quite deliberately. Uh, it was not simply a, a question of being careless or speaking when they were drunk or what have you, or speaking to a friend. They, doing it, they were doing it quite deliberately. And if they were doing it deliberately, they had to be sophisticated to know, enough to know, in view of what had happened before in previous administrations, that they might be tapped. So they didn't.